If you turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth. I want to add my word of welcome to those of you who are here. Lamentations 3.22 says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. That his mercies never come to an end. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. On Friday, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. On Friday in Newtown, Connecticut, His mercies never come to an end. It's very difficult to believe that in some times, isn't it? I can't imagine what it would be like to have to mount the pulpit this morning and stand before those who are there in Newtown, Connecticut. I can't imagine what I would say. I don't know what I would say to them because I don't know them. I'm not their pastor. But that doesn't really let me off the hook, does it? Because I am your pastor. And some of you are asking the same question that they're asking. You're asking, why? Not only because of that tragedy, but because of the tragedies in which you have experienced in your life. Why? And what would I say to those people? Well, I would suppose, I guess I would continue on in Lamentations 3, where it says, The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good to the, the Lord is good to those who wait for him. Maybe I would say that. But how do you wait? How do you wait in the midst of such tragedy? Well, to answer that question, I think I would turn to the book of Ruth. Because one of the central themes in the book of Ruth, as I was taught by one of my seminary professors, a man named Jay Scalar, one of the central themes of the book of Ruth holds the answer to that question. I'm going to do something if you're new here that I don't normally do, and, and that is that it's my normal my normal um, way of preaching is to focus in on a couple verses, a specific text, but, you know, some messages aren't seen in specific text. You have to read the whole book and let the story unfold. So this morning, I'm going to be preaching from all of Ruth, the entire book, but to get us started, I'm just going to read chapter 1, verse 19 through 21. This is God's word. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And they came to Bethlehem, and the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Thus ends the reading of God's word. Let me pray for us. In the midst of the clamor, Father... In the midst of the difficulty, would you speak tenderly to us and somehow convince us that your steadfast love never ceases, that your mercies never come to an end? We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, the book is titled Ruth. That's what we call it. But it begins and ends with another character. Her name is Naomi. She is the wife of Elimelech, 
the mother of two sons, Malon and Tilion. She is an Israelite, living in the time of the judges, some 11 or 1200 years before Jesus. And she is from Bethlehem, Jesus' birth town. And the first five verses set the scene for us, and it's not a pretty picture. We learn at the very beginning that there's a famine in the land which forces Naomi, her husband, and her two sons out of Israel to the country of Moab. It's a familiar pattern if you know anything about the Bible. Going away and coming back. Exile and homecoming. And this isn't the first time we've seen it. Abraham was forced down to the land of Egypt because of famine. And then he returned. A few generations later, Jacob's sons were forced out of the land of Israel because of famine. And they returned. This wouldn't be the last time we'll see it either. The people of Israel would be forced out of the land again because of famine. And every time we know, when they're forced out, it's always tragic. It was tragic for Naomi as well. Verse 3, we find that she loses her husband, Elimelech. Fortunately, she has two sons who, verse 4, says marry Moabite women. But those fortunes don't last long. Because we read in verse 5 that both Malon and Chilion died. So that she was left without her two sons and her husband. The death of a child is one of the most tragic things that anyone can ever experience. I can't imagine. I can't imagine what the parents of the 20 must be feeling this morning. The only thing that helps me or lets me get close to it is a time when I was at a funeral service for a 12-year-old boy of a, a close family friend. He died of spina bifida. And I'll never forget when his father mounted the pulpit that morning, scanned the congregation and said, I have the worst seat in the house. And I pray to the Lord that none of you ever have to sit where I am sitting this morning. The loss of a child is one of the most tragic things that anyone can ever experience. Christian philosopher Nicholas Wolterstorff lost his son Eric when he was at the ripe age. His son Eric was at the ripe age of 25. In his book, A Lament for a Son, he writes, What makes the death of a child so indescribably painful? I buried my father and that was hard. But nothing at all like this one expects to bury one's parent. One doesn't expect, in our day and age, to bury one's child. The burial of a child is a retching alteration of expectations. But it's more than that. I feel it more than that. I feel it the more, but cannot speak of it. The death of a child is one of the most tragic things that anyone could ever experience. And we learned that Naomi has not only lost her husband, she has lost her children. In fact, there's a common word for child in the Hebrew Bible. It's the word ben. And that's the word that is used normally for children or for sons, and it's used throughout these verse five verses. Every time it's used, every time except verse 5 which says that the woman was left without her two yeleds. Yeled. It's a word that is used in the Hebrew Bible to describe almost every time very small children. As if to say, Naomi has not only lost her sons, She's lost her baby boy. How do you wait? 
How do you wait in the midst of tragedy? How do you deal with this in the midst of tragedy? How do you wait when you're in Naomi's situation? Perhaps some of you have been there. How do you wait when you're left with nothing? I mean, think about what is Naomi left with? In that day and age, a widow, the only recourse she had to goods and services was through either a brother-in-law or her sons. Naomi has neither. What is she left with? Two daughter-in-laws who are also widowed. Ruth and Orpah. And it's easy to be in Ruth's situation and to assume, perhaps, if you've been there, that somehow, someway, God is now against you. That he is against you. That he is, in fact, punishing you. It's a natural conclusion to come to. It's actually the conclusion that Naomi comes to. We see that in verse 13. Let me catch you up to the story. Naomi has found out that the famine has stopped in Israel that Bethlehem has food, and so she is going to go back and return. And and as she's going, she tells her daughter-in-laws, listen, there are no prospects of husbands or life or life or a future for you there. You need to stay here. And they're insisting to go with her. And she says, no, don't go with me. And here's the reason she gives. Verse 13. No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Don't come with me because don't you see I am jinxed. God is against me and if you come with me, then your life will end up tragic as well. We think, well, maybe she's having a bad day. I mean, we all think that for a moment, right? Right? We all have those kind of moments in life and we think uh, things are bad and then what do we do? We watch a Seinfeld, we go for a run, and then we get over it. Well, we might think she's having a bad day until we get to verse 19. Naomi has returned to Bethlehem and it's harvest time. As she's walking up the road, uh, the women who are out working in the fields, they look up and they see her. It's been 10 years, and they think, is this Naomi? Can this be Naomi? Verse 19. And notice how Naomi responds. Do not call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitterness. Because the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Don't call me Naomi. That's a joke. Call me Mara, for I am full of bitterness. I went away full and I have come back empty. Maybe you have felt like that. Maybe even like her, you feel like you were in the witness stand and the Lord is pointing his finger against you. The Lord has testified against me. Perhaps because of some suffering, a physical ailment. Maybe because of a relationship that is broken down. Perhaps because of a financial hardship, you assume, perhaps it's easy, like Naomi, that the Lord is against me. That everything in your circumstances is yelling at you, blaring out, God is against you. And you think back of all these things that you might have done wrong in your life that he might be punishing you for. And perhaps even you don't know what those things might be, but you just know, you hear the sound, God cannot be for me. That's the sound that Naomi hears. But it's not the only voice in the book of Ruth. If we listen throughout the chapters of Ruth, we will hear another voice speaking another message. A message of comfort and hope. And if we listen closely, we can even hear it speaking here in chapter 1, right in the midst of calamity. 
We hear it actually in verse 14. Remember, Naomi has lost her husband and her sons. And she's found out that there is food in Bethlehem. So she's planning on going back. And she tells her daughters to stay, her daughters-in-law. She insists, but they respond. Verse 14, they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law as if to say goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Now that word clung is most famously used the first time when Genesis 2 talks about how a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to or cleave to his wife. It's talking about the deepest commitment that a person can have for another person. What the Hebrews might call hesed, covenant loyalty, steadfast love. And look, you can see that this is the promise that Ruth is making to her, this kind of covenant loyalty. Because she goes on to say, Do not urge me to leave you, verse 16, or return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God will be my God. And where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more, if anything but death parts me from you. She's even invoking a covenant curse. If I leave your side, let death happen to me. This is covenant language. And do you see, do you hear the voice? Do you hear the voice speaking, saying, Oh, Ruth. I mean, oh, Naomi, oh, Naomi, don't you see? Don't you see that even in the midst of tragedy, my steadfast love never ceases? Don't you see that I am not against you? Look at Ruth. Do you see Ruth? Don't you see that she's simply a manifestation of my steadfast love to you? I was talking with someone this week who had gone through some very tragic circumstances earlier this year. Uh, They were devastating. And one of the hardest things about it was that this person had a diagnosis that they were mentally um, handicapped, unstable. And as I was talking to them about it, I I just asked, uh, well, do you feel like since that time the medications have helped? And the person looked at me and they said, I'm sure they have helped and I'm sure they'll help in the long run. But I'll tell you what has got me through this time. It's been my church. And my Christian friends, my community, who is stuck by me, that's what's got me through. How do you wait? How do you wait in the midst of tragedy? Perhaps you this morning feel like the Lord is against you. Perhaps you are in the midst of calamity. Might I suggest that you stop and look around and see if anyone has stuck by you, and might the Lord be showing his steadfast love and faithfulness and covenant loyalty to you through a friend who is stuck next to you through thick and thin? Could that be God's whisper to say, oh, don't you know that the presence of tragedy in your life does not mean that I am against you? Don't you see that my steadfast love never ceases? Some of you are in the shoes of Naomi, but, and if you aren't now, then you will be one day because we don't escape tragedy. But lots of us are not in those shoes. We are actually in the shoes of Ruth. And we know people around us who are going through devastating, tragic circumstances. And it is very, very easy in those moments to want to withdraw because we don't understand and we don't know what to say and we don't know how to help and and we can't answer their questions. We can't answer why. Don't withdraw. Ruth is not called to answer why. The book of Ruth does not answer the question why. But what it does say is in the midst of the tragedy, the Lord's steadfast love has not ceased. And our role is not to answer the question why, but to stand next to the people in the midst of the tragedy, to stand next to our friends and loved ones and be a testimony to them that God's steadfast love does not cease. 
it's doubtful in many circumstances that your friend will hear you, that they will hear that voice at first. Naomi didn't hear it now, I'm sure. The pain was just too raw. But God keeps speaking. He keeps speaking in chapter 2. Let me catch you up to what's happened. It is the harvest time, and during this time, Israelite law said that after the reapers would go through and they would take the barley from the fields, there would be people who would come and they would collect the barley. But there was always some left over. And Israelite law said that widows and the poor could actually go through and take some of that barley, that they could pick up what remained. And so Ruth goes out, because she is the younger of the two, and she looks for a place to collect some food for them, because this is their only resource. And in verse 3, we read that she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. It was unintentional. She didn't know Boaz. She didn't know why she was there. But Boaz, he happened to come to the field at that time as well to survey it, to see what was going on. It's his construction site. He wants to see how things are running. And as he looks over the field and he sees people there, he notices a foreigner, one whom he does not know. He doesn't recognize. And he asks his foreman in verse 5, who is this? And the foreman tells him, this is Ruth. And somehow he finds out and he learns of Ruth's steadfast, loyal love to Naomi. And he says, wow. I'm moved. I want to show Ruth and Naomi that same loyal love. And so he calls Ruth aside and he gives her some water and food. And he says, you don't look for another field to glean in. You, you glean here, you'll be fine. And in fact, he even uh, sets her up. He tells his workers to leave a little extra behind. And then he loads her up and she returns home. And when she returns home, uh, well, before she returns, I mean, when she returns home, she comes to Naomi. Now, perhaps I need to stop here and note that this meeting between Ruth and between Boaz was unintentional. That's what the author is saying when he says she happened to come there. And, and Boaz didn't know Ruth was going to be there either. That's why he asked his form in verse 5. But just because it was unintentional on their parts doesn't mean that it was unintended. Let me explain what I mean. When she gets back home to Naomi, Naomi notices that she has a great deal of grain, more than anyone would ever collect in a day. And in verse 9, uh, she says to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. She knows somebody has set her up. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I've worked today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her mother-in-law, I mean her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living and the dead. Do you hear it? Do you hear the voice? Whose kindness... It's that word, if you know any words in Hebrew before today, that this is the word you probably know. It's the word hesed, normally translated steadfast love. See what's going on. She's saying God has been and God has shown his steadfast love to us through the steadfast love of Boaz. Naomi begins to hear. When Pam and I were in England, we were going through a very uh, difficult time because um, we came upon some difficult circumstances. We were set to move. Pam was changing jobs, and in the midst of the change, she was, apply uh, she was uh, getting her paperwork done in this hospital. It got delayed um, for a couple months. Unfortunately, we were living month to month at a time. Uh, at that point in our lives. And so because of that, we were out. Uh, we needed to give a deposit to our new place where we were moving. The last people were not were waiting to give us a deposit. So we were month to month. We were out these two deposits, and we didn't know what we were going to do. Uh, some of One of my friends at the church was a deacon. He figured out about our situation. He came to me, and he asked. He said, it looks, I don't mean to, to pry, but it looks like you guys could be in some need. 
I said, well, yes, I, we are. I, I don't know how we're going to get over the next month. He says, well, how about this? The church will give you money for groceries, and we'll, give, we'll loan you the money for the deposit. Would that help? I said, that would be perfect. That would what would get us by. It, it was the steadfast love of the Lord speaking to us through the generosity of someone else. It happened a couple years later in England when we were there. I had a car that I would use to drive around and preach supply at various churches and uh, that didn't have a, a minister. Um, and as I, I was driving around with this car, it, it finally broke down. It was kind of a clunker. And to fix it would cost more than the car was worth. And so I was out. And a family found out about this, and they came and they gave us a check to use how we would like. But it was the check which provided the seed money to get that next car so that I could continue to minister to these churches. There's the Lord whispering to us in the midst of this difficult circumstance that my steadfast love has not ceased. The presence of tragedy in your life does not mean that I am against you. In fact, I am for you. Naomi begins to hear the whisper. But it doesn't stop there. Now we move on to chapter 3. And remember, you need to remember what's going on. Naomi and Ruth, why are they in the situation that they're in? Uh, they've both lost their husbands. And Naomi has lost her daughter-in-law. And so what happens is Naomi does what any well-meaning, well-intended, older, godly woman would do when she has a younger, single friend who she cares for. She sets her up. What many of you have done. And this is how it works. She says, uh, here's the plan. She says, here's what I want you to do, Ruth. I want you to first take a bath. And then after you take a bath, I want you to put on your best perfume. And then I want you to put on a cloak to hide yourself, and I want you to go to the threshing floor. Now, to understand uh, Naomi's plan, you need to know something about the threshing floor. The threshing floor was the place during this time where they would separate the kernels from the husk and the barley. And during that time, the days were very long and very hard. So often what they would do is at the end of the long, hard work day, they would just have a big meal, drink some wine, and go to sleep right there on the threshing floor. And Naomi says, here's what I want you to do, Ruth. I want you to put on the cloak after you've taken a shower and put on your best perfume. I want you to go over to the threshing floor. I want you to hide out. I want you to look for Boaz. Once he's eaten and had his fill and is satisfied and he lays down on the floor and he starts to go to sleep, you notice where he is. And once everybody's asleep, I want you to go in there. And then here's what I want you to do. His robe, it'll be kind of like his blanket it's going to be covering. I want you to take the tip of it and I want you to lift it up over his feet. And then I want you to lay there right by his feet. Now, I know we have some eligible young single women in the congregation. And I know what you're thinking. Do not try this at home. <laughs> because the instructions are explicitly to go to his work, okay? Don't do it at your home. Go to his work. I'm kidding, people. Come on. <laughs> All right. It bombed. It bombed. Um, but anyway, so she, she goes there, and she does as she is told. And you can imagine Boaz's surprise when a young woman wakes up, and he wakes up to find a young woman at his feet, verse 9. He says, who are you? She answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wing over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, may you be blessed, among the Lord, um, blessed by the Lord, my daughter, now, to understand what's going on here when he talks about, when she says, spread your wings over your servant, when she talks about spreading your wings, she's talking about that tip of the robe which she has pulled up, and she's saying, put that over me, right? Now, this is kind of odd. What's going on here? Well, let me suggest to you what's going on um, in a 2012 scenario. Uh, you've been hanging out with some dude, and you're wondering if when he's going to, you know, pop the question. And you feel like he's affectionate towards you, but you're not sure. And earlier that day, you were at Pizza Hut together because he likes to spend big. And as you're there at Pizza Hut, uh, he had a leftover quarter from his five that he broke so that you guys could split the all-you-can-eat buffet. And after you split the all-you-can-eat buffet and there's that quarter, he gave it to you very kindly. And you took it over to the little machine, you know, where you put the quarter in and you twist it. And lo and behold, a plastic ring comes out. 
Later that day, you are walking, and uh, he needs to tie his shoe. As he's down tying his shoe, you pop out the plastic ring, which you hold in one hand, and you place your, uh, your ring finger out with the other hand, and you say, all right, what's it going to be? What's it going to be, Boaz? That's what's going on here. This is a marriage proposal. She is saying, symbolically, as the ring symbolically represents marriage, she's saying, symbolically, place me under the comfort, the protection of your wing. It's a marriage proposal. And Boaz obliges. He says, there's only one problem. There's this other dude, and he's got first dips, right? So I need to talk to him tomorrow. But if he, if he will... Uh, if he w- doesn't want to marry you and uh, work that out, then I will marry you. In the meantime, she sends Ruth back home to Naomi. And when she comes to Naomi, we read what he sends her home with all this extra food. And we read about what happens in verse 17. Naomi does what anybody does who sets up a couple, a young couple. After the date, she goes, verse 16, How did you fare, my daughter? How'd it go? And when she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave me, for he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Is there anything that sounds very familiar about Boaz's words? Empty-handed. It's the second time we've heard that word. In the Hebrew, it's just the word empty. Do you remember what Naomi said in chapter 1, verse 21, when the women said, it's Naomi? She said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for I went away full, and I have come back empty. As one pastor I heard, one person I heard preach on this say, it is as if God is taking Naomi's own words and putting them through the mouth of Boaz to say, I know about your emptiness. I am not unaware of your emptiness, and I am going to do something about it. See, sometimes, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, it is in the very place where we feel the tragedy and the pain that God takes that he uses to communicate his steadfast love to us. The very word that was so striking and deep and hurtful for Naomi was the word empty. And it was that word through the mouth of Boaz that God wanted to say, Oh, Naomi, don't you see, even in the midst of tragedy, my steadfast love never ceases. My mercies never end. Do not let your tragic circumstances uh, convince you that I am against you. I am not against you. I am for you. And it can be sometimes that in those very places where you feel the wound most deeply, that God could take that very wound and use that to communicate his steadfast, loyal love to you. That's what he does for Naomi. That's what he does till the end. He speaks until the end of this story. This isn't last, the last time we will hear the voice. Let me catch you up on what happens next. Boaz goes to the elders um, at the city, which is where legal matters are decided. And he asks the man who is first in line for Ruth, do you want to marry Ruth? No, I don't think I want to marry Ruth. Okay, I'm going to marry Ruth. Your loss. So he then marries Ruth. They have a child. And then we read in verse 16 of chapter 4 that Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. Any idea what the word for child there might be in the Hebrew? Remember at the beginning of the book when Naomi lost her two little yeleds? Well, we come back to the end of the book, and she now has a yeled in her arms, nursing him. 
as if to say, Oh, Naomi, don't you see? Don't you see that my steadfast love never ceases? Don't you know that the presence of tragedy in your life does not mean that I am against you? We're not exactly sure how well Naomi heard all these voices. We're not sure how loud they were. We're not sure if she sees them as clearly as we do in the moment. There is one voice that sounds in this book, though, that we know that she could never have heard. No, readers of this text couldn't hear it for thousands of years, or at least 1,200. But we can. It's the voice that comes through in verse 17, when it says that the women of the town named the child Obed. Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David, who was the king, who was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And, fa- and Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam was the father of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was the father of Josiah. And Josiah was the father of Jacob. And Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. Do you hear the voice? Do you hear the voice made flesh? Do you hear the voice that made himself vulnerable? Contracted, contracted to a span. Do you hear the voice that says, please do not think that the presence of tragedy in your life means that I am against you. Please know that even in the midst of your tragedy, I am for you. Please know that my steadfast love never ceases. Because I too have experienced pain and tragedy. And not only have I experienced pain and tragedy with you, I have experienced pain and tragedy for you, on your behalf, taking your sin on my shoulders. And there, there, I took on all pain and all tragedy. And when you doubt, when you doubt... When your circumstances tell you that I am against you, I want you to stop, I want you to look, and I want you to listen. I want you to look to a hill outside Jerusalem. A hill which the Jews called Golgotha and the Romans called Calvary. And there I want you to listen to a voice. A voice that speaks louder than the blood of Abel. A voice that says, in all your afflictions, I am afflicted. Isaiah 63, 9. A voice that says, please know that the presence of tragedy in your life does not mean that I am against you. I am for you. Please know that your suffering does not mean that I am against you. And please know that my suffering means that I love you more than you could ever imagine. And please know this as well. That neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate you from my steadfast love. For in Jesus Christ, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, and his mercies never fail. For I, too, have lost my yellhead, my baby boy, that you might know, that you might know that I love you and will always love you. Amen and amen.